Um, hello and good evening, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome you on behalf of the Aurora project. Uh, as most of you may know, uh, the Aurora project is a cooperation of uh, four uh, countries and five institutions uh, from Tunisia, from Morocco, uh, from Lebanon and from Germany, um, uh, which is uh, the PI is Andreas Thiel, who is with us, and I'm coordinating the project. Uh, our main focus is um, uh, exchange on curriculum development on social ecological systems and related content um, for master students. Um, and um, yeah, this is the first project here. Uh, the webinar series uh, has been running for quite a while, quite successful, we think. Um, if you have missed one, some of them, uh, um, Arbet will give us the link to the YouTube channel uh, in the chat. Uh, so you, uh, you, you can uh, just look for the Aurora webinar series on YouTube. Um, so, uh, and uh, at the end of the sessions, we want, might want to uh, um, also um, announce uh, that we have two extra sessions. We initially planned on only five sessions, but we will uh, end up doing seven sessions. So there will be two more sessions, I guess, uh, in February. Um, so uh, we will keep you posted on this. Uh, so thank you very much for your interest and uh, thank you for registering and being with us tonight. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, uh, who is Hussam Hussein. Uh, he is uh, a political scientist working on uh, the political economy of water scarcity um, with a Middle East focus. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Hussein was, uh, uh, got his PhD at the University of East Anglia and since then has worked as a postdoc uh, amongst other things um, in uh, the American University of Beirut in Lebanon at, at University of Kassel uh, in Germany and is now uh, situated at Oxford where he teaches international relations and uh, researches uh, or hydropolitics. Um, well, uh, his uh, focus uh, will be uh, on uh, the political economy and uh, discourses on water scarcity in Jordan and uh, which is, is one of the focus of his research. Um, yeah, uh, so without further ado, I will give over to uh, Hussam and uh, we will do it like that, that we will have half an hour uh, talk and uh, afterwards we have half an hour question and answer session. So uh, uh, please um, keep your questions in mind or you can write them in the chat box and uh, later on. Uh, we will have a discussion. Thank you very much and uh, uh, welcome, Hosan. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Zuren and uh, colleagues uh, from uh, Witzenhaus and, uh, and uh, uh, the other consortium universities. Um, it is a pleasure and I'm very uh, delighted to uh, be able to uh, be part of this uh, Aurora series today and uh, present this uh, uh, is a seminar on the politics of water scarcity in the case of Jordan. Uh, so the research problem is uh, Jordan's water scarcity. Jordan and the MENA region is uh, one of the most water scarce regions in the world. So the issue of water shortage and water scarcity is real in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and uh, Jordan in particular is uh, said to be the second most water scarce country in the world. Uh, and this comes with other implications, such as also the groundwater situation. Groundwater resources in Jordan are decreasing in terms of quantity and quality due to overuse and overextraction of uh, uh, this resource. In addition, 35% more or less of the population is formed by refugees. And uh, about 90% of uh, the food products that uh, in Jordan are imported so that the food consumed in the country is imported, and about 50% of Jordan's water supply goes to agriculture. So those are just some headlines that we will then unpack throughout the presentation. But just to show the importance of uh, uh, talking and uh, investigating water scarcity 
in the country. And these reasons, these three reasons in particular, push me to investigate the political economy of the Jordanian water sector using the discourse of water scarcity as an entry point. And the discourse of water scarcity, because we saw that the Mena region is said to be the most water scarce region in the world, and Jordan is said to be the second most water scarce country in the world. And this is something that is quite generally known in, uh, uh, in Jordan, in um, uh, water circles. And therefore, this, uh, my, the goal of my research has been and is to try to better understand the water problem in uh, Jordan in order to be able to support policy change in the water sector towards a more sustainable use of water resources in the country, which ultimately would, uh, would also result in supporting water security uh, and ways to ensure water security in Jordan. So when we speak of environmental degradation in uh, Jordan, uh, I already mentioned the groundwater resources that are over extracted and the level is, increase, is uh, decreasing both in quality and quantity uh, in a very rapid way, <clears throat> especially in the northern part of the country, uh, as we will see later. Um, Another environmental degradation issue is uh, uh, the state of the lower part of the Jordan River, which is uh, uh, decreasing both in terms of the flow, uh, as it has decreased by 97% uh, compared to its uh, historical uh, flow, compared to the 30s, for instance, but also in terms of biodiversity, which has decreased by 50%. And uh, the lower Jordan, the lower part of the Jordan River or the Jordan River basin um, flows into the Dead Sea and the decrease in the flow of the Jordan River has resulted also in a decrease of the Dead Sea, which has already disappeared by one third, as we can see in this uh, picture in this slide, but also it keeps this, uh, decreasing by one meter per year. So this is another example of environmental degradation. Um, Obviously, they are due to different reasons, as we will see uh, also uh, for water scarcity in Jordan. In this slide, we can see the importance of water uh, in, in shared waters and transboundary water resources in Jordan. Um, about 40% of uh, water resources are shared, but in particular, we can see that um, two out of three rivers in the country are shared. So the main two rivers are the Yarmouk River and the Jordan River, and they're both shared with other countries. And the third river is the Zarka River, which is a smaller river and uh, is within uh, Jordan. However, when it comes to the first two rivers that I mentioned, the uh, Jordan River and the uh, Yarmouk River, the Jordan River is shared uh, with four other countries. So it's shared by uh, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Palestine, Jordan, and Israel. So five countries in total. Um, and uh, uh, it's an agreement, the 1994 agreement, the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan, which uh, has also an annex uh, and for a section uh, discussing the location of these uh, uh, water resources between Israel and uh, Jordan, um, but only for the lower part of the Jordan River um, and also partly for the Yarmouk River. So that's the 1994 agreement. The other one is the 1987 uh, agreement between Jordan and Syria concerning the Yarmouk River, uh, which is uh, quite of an important river for Jordan and is uh, shared, as you can see, it's part of the border uh, in the north uh, western part of the country between Jordan and uh, Syria. <clears throat> and uh, finally, the 2015 agreement between uh, Jordan and Saudi Arabia is uh, quite important because it's uh, the one on the DC aquifer, which is uh, one of the most important uh, groundwater resources in Jordan, uh, which is currently being used for also for uh, drinking water. So this slide shows us how water resources are, uh, what are the water resources that we have in the country, in Jordan, and how these water resources are being used. Um, <clears throat> so these data are 2017, however, are more or less still applicable. Um, and as you can see, water 
resources, uh, and that's the uh, bottom left uh, uh, graph, shows us that uh, uh, about 59% of water sources in the country are surface water resources. Then we can see that 27% of the water resources are groundwater, and then 14% are treated wastewater. This is quite interesting when we compare this graph with the one uh, on the top, uh, which is the water uses. And we can see, no, before going there, sorry, <laughs> let's go to the one on the right. It's quite interesting comparing that one with the one on the right because it shows uh, the sources of water supply. And here we can see clearly that most of the water resources uh, that contribute to the, to the water supply, 54%, uh, the blue part, are groundwater resources. So uh, the question would be why do we, do we, do we use 54%, 54% of, uh, um, of uh, I mean, why 54% of the sources of water supply comes from uh, groundwater instead of surface water, while we see that most of the water resources that we have in the country are surface water. And the answer to this is uh, linked to the previous uh, slide that we saw, the one on, uh, uh, on uh, the transboundary, the, the relevance and importance of transboundary water resources in the country. So given that the, most of the surface water resources, most of the rivers in the country are of transboundary uh, origin, it is easier for Jordan to use uh, water that is not shared with neighboring countries and for groundwater resources. Uh, for their uh, source of water supply. Um, so this is uh, the reason why uh, water supply comes mainly from groundwater sources, because most of the groundwater sources being used are uh, all internal to the country, and therefore Jordan does not really have to negotiate with neighboring countries, uh, apart from the DC that we already saw, where there is an agreement between Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Uh, so Jordan does not really need to negotiate with uh, neighboring countries, given that most of the groundwater resources being used are within the country. Uh, moreover, uh, and this links to the issue of uh, de de depletion and uh, decreasing quantity and quality of groundwater resources, Jordan is overusing groundwater resources uh, because uh, as we saw, it's easier to use politically at least water resources that are within your country uh, but the risk is to overuse them and therefore not use them in a sustainable way, uh, which uh, will have implications, especially in the long term, in terms of quantity and quality of water resources. Finally, here in this slide, uh, we can look at the graph on uh, the top left. And here we can see that how water are being used in the country. And you can see that most of the water resources are being used for domestic use, about 52%. Um, which means uh, for drinking uses and municip municipal uses. Uh, about 45% are being used for agriculture and then uh, only about 3% for industry. This slide unpacks a bit more uh, the previous slide on the water, is, water uses, especially uh, the 45% of, uh, of uh, water used for agriculture. This slide shows us that uh, Jordan imports more than 90% of the food consumed uh, in the country. Um, and then it also tells us that the, what is the role of agriculture in the country? And in terms of economy, GDP, we can see that it's only 3%. And this is also similar to the percentage of labor force employed in the uh, in this sector. Obviously, uh, numbers, I mean, coming from a qualitative <laughs> Methodological uh, approach. Uh, I mean, numbers might be uh, also misleading sometimes, and uh, in this context, uh, it really depends what we mean with agriculture. So, what do we include in the three percent of agriculture? Um, in fact, we could also uh, increase it by considering the all the supply chain, and therefore that three percent will become maybe 15, 20 percent. However, I think the important uh, aspect here to remember is that about 90% of the food consumed in the country is imported and therefore the food produced in the country is not really contributing much to the food security of Jordan. Um, but yeah, I mean, agriculture is certainly something that we go back uh, and reflect more uh, throughout this presentation. So the guiding question here, uh, guiding this uh, research project 
is how is the discourse of water scarcity constructed in the case of Jordan? As I was mentioning, a qualitative methodology was adopted, uh, looking in particular at written documentation, which included media articles, so newspapers, governmental reports, ministry, uh, relevant ministries, uh, reports and documentation, strategies and policies, but also uh, reports of donors and international organizations, academic literature on the topic uh, of water issues in Jordan, and also textbooks to see how students in Jordan grew up learning about the challenge and the, of, about the issue of water, uh, scarcity in uh, uh, Jordan. After that, I also adopted uh, semi-structured interviews, uh, in particular uh, to those that uh, wrote the reports or the articles uh, or the textbooks to try to understand why they emphasize certain issues greater than others. Uh, and then observation of policymakers and, uh, influ and influential uh, people and water professionals uh, uh, and how they phrased and framed the challenge of water scarcity in, for instance, uh, uh, conferences, uh, workshops, um, the World Water Week and other important international but also national events. And finally, also some focus groups, both at the beginning and at the, at the end of the project, with uh, really with, uh, I, I targeted uh, normal people, so like the broader population. So uh, both farmers, but also students at the university and other uh, segments of society to try to capture at the beginning of the project, what were the main discourses about water scarcity? So I was asking them why there is water scarcity? What do you think are the causes? What can we do to solve them? And so it was quite interesting to try to capture the different uh, discourses that were emerging. And then at the end of the project, it was just to double check and test my findings. So that was methodologically how I proceeded. And here is the main, uh, the main finding about how the discourse was constructed. And the main finding is that everyone in Jordan agrees that water scarcity is an important issue, but they disagree on the nuances on the different causes uh, behind water scarcity. Uh, I found in particular two, uh, two groups, uh, which we can call narratives of, or, or sub-discourses. Um, and the first one, uh, the larger one, because larger because it's the most influential, is the one that came up uh, more often is the one that has more space uh, in uh, the public discourses about water is the one on the left and is the one that emphasized uh, that there is water scarcity due to limited water resources uh, that we have in Jordan. Um, and these limited water resources are due mainly to four reasons and the size of the of the of the image here uh, reflect more or less the, 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 the importance uh, that, that appeared from a discursive perspective uh, that was associated to each of them. So the largest one was population growth, immigration, and refugees. So they argue that we have water scarcity because we have limited water resources due to uh, a growing population. So Jordan used to have less than uh, or about half a million uh, people living in Jordan when it was created and it became independent in 1946. And over the years and the decades, uh, it grew until uh, five, six million in the 90s. And then uh, we had a population of about seven million about 12 years ago. In the past decade, following different um, Way, I mean, different, uh, different um, regional conflicts that resulted in uh, refugees finding um, uh, in Jordan a safe place where to move. Um, Jordan increased, the population of Jordan increased to about, um, there's different data, but I would say uh, about 11 million today. Uh, so obviously uh, satisfying the needs of uh, concerning water of seven or eight million in 2010, it's different than having to uh, face uh, a population of 11 million. So obviously there's an increased uh, water uh, demand. 
But that's not the only reason. So that's one reason. The other one is uh, the unfair sharing with neighboring countries. So often uh, one of the reasons that is emphasized is that mm, an extensive part of water resources in the country, the most important rivers in the country are shared with neighboring countries and Jordan is not getting its fair share. And here there's different nuances. Some people would argue that it is Israel who is uh, stealing uh, uh, Jordanian's water or not respecting the 1994 agreement fully. Um, some others would say no, that actually uh, Israel has been cooperating better than, uh, than, uh, the, Israel than, than uh, the Syrians. The Syrians are seen as not having been fulfilling the 1987 agreement, a bilateral agreement between Jordan and uh, Syria on the Yarmouk, and therefore found it uh, easier to collaborate uh, from a water perspective with the Israelis. And therefore, there's different, depending on who I was speaking with, uh, there, there were these two different um, blames. So one targeting more uh, the Israelis, especially on the Jordan River, and the other one uh, targeting more the Syrians, in mainly on the, I mean, on the Yarmouk River. Um, and therefore, I mean, in their view, given that most of our neighboring countries are not uh, giving us the fair, our fair share, as, as Jordanians, obviously, um, this is why we are in a situation of water scarcity. Uh, other two reasons instead uh, emphasize the, the role of uh, the environment and nature. Uh, one, targeting mainly the climate, climate change as being an additional pressure to water resources. As we all know, climate change is uh, putting an additional pressure in terms of uh, temperatures, in terms, in terms of, of precipitations, uh, uh, patterns, regeneration of uh, groundwater, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously an increasing challenge. And finally, <clears throat> aridity and low precipitation. So some people would argue, well, it's normal to be, I mean, it's the Middle East. Middle East has always been uh, an arid region, desert, most of the country in Jordan, uh, of Jordan is uh, arid or semi-arid, so it's normal to have low, low precipitation, so it has always been the case. We should not be shocked. Um, so naturalizing a bit in the issue of water scarcity. Um, these four reasons, so I was saying, emphasize the fact that we have water scarcity due to uh, limited water resources, and they all drive towards uh, uh, the need as a solution to increase the supply. So by increasing the supply, we would then be able to uh, match the growing demand. That's the first uh, uh, comment about this. The other one uh, is also interesting to see and to look at who is uh, behind or emphasizing these four reasons. And um, they are mainly uh, governmental sources, so it's mainly the ministries, it's mainly uh, organizations or mass media quite aligned with the government and the, with, the, with, with, the, with the ministries. And therefore, it's also quite unsurprising if we look at the blame, who is uh, being blamed in these four reasons. Certainly not the government, the blame is either on nature and the environment, or our neighboring countries in terms of refugees and people coming from there, or in terms of the governments of, of neighboring countries not respecting the, uh, the rights, the fair share of uh, Jordan's water resources. Good, so let's move now to the other uh, three reasons uh, or the other subgroup or narrative. And the other one, the other narrative says that we have water scarcity, we agree on this, However, the reason is uh, mismanagement. We have water scarcity because if water is being mismanaged. If only we better use our and manage our, our water resources, we would not be in this situation. The three causes behind uh, water uh, scarcity for these groups are three. One is uh, no revenue water due to leakages and physical losses. So really emphasizing that about 30, 40%, that's different data that go from 25 to 50%. They say uh, that between 25 and 50% of water sources in the country are no revenue water um, due to leakages and physical losses, as well as due to legal wells and illegal connections and illegal users. Um, 
So this is uh, uh, one, uh, so two, I would say, <laughs> the non-revenue water, the two, the two, two reasons. And the third one is the agriculture. So that is seen as being unsustainable in its use of water resources. And uh, this can be unpacked further in different, and goes in different directions. Some people would emphasize the use of technology, for instance, that, uh, and therefore agriculture can be and could be maybe more efficient. Uh, these criticism usually go more in the direction of those uh, doing agriculture, educated agriculture in, uh, uh, in the highlands, in northern Jordan, and not really uh, towards the Jordan Valley, which is seen as being more advanced uh, also in terms of efficiency and uh, in, uh, of technology. Um, another criticism is uh, more coming from a virtual water perspective, so tr arguing that uh, and therefore targeting mainly uh, the large agribusinesses in the country, especially in the northern Jordan and in the past also in the DC area, saying that a country like Jordan, which is, as we saw, quite water scarce, should not uh, export uh, agricultural products because the water uh, there that would be expand. Uh, um, exporting uh, water resources, uh, which is embedded in agricultural products. Firstly, and secondly, it's also about the type of crops. So uh, we need to be wise, they would argue, on which type of crops we have in the country. Uh, and uh, when we export, we should not export agricultural products that, that are very water intensive. Um, and therefore, obviously, we would not need or, should, or we should probably not uh, export or not even produce some other argue, uh, bananas, watermelons, and uh, tomatoes, while maybe we should focus more on dates. Um, so yeah, there's different considerations, different suggestions. Most of them are criticized from different perspectives. Um, there's no consensus. However, I mean, that's the direction of those uh, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, field. Um, so that's, uh, but it's interesting to look at uh, who is uh, behind this. And um, I would argue that it's mainly NGOs, international organizations, donors, um, some academics. So people that are not really aligned with the government, uh, they are behind this. However, it's also important to emphasize that uh, they, I mean, those behind this water mismanagement narrative, they also acknowledge the importance of the other four reasons that we mentioned before. Uh, they just say they would just say that they're all important. However, the water mismanagement ones are more important. And the same thing for the others. They would just de-emphasize those and emphasize maybe more the others. Okay. Uh, let's look uh, quickly at the solutions. So we already mentioned that uh, the first group emphasized more the, uh, the, the supply side solutions. And the others uh, uh, would argue, as I said, that we should just better manage the water resources that we have. And therefore, water demand management are the solutions that they emphasize. Briefly, let's go through the main uh, solutions that we have listed here. Concerning the, um, the, the, the supply side, the first one is the Red Sea, Dead Sea Canal project, which is a project that has been um, discussed and mentioned uh, uh, for different decades, since the 90s at least, uh, and it has changed shape many times. Uh, currently, uh, it has changed shape many times uh, following political uh, dynamics. Um, and uh, basically, the idea, the original idea was to have a regional project involving Israelis, Palestinians, and Jordanians. Having uh, this regional project financed uh, internationally and globally um, to support the construction of a canal from the Red Sea to the Red Sea uh, in order to save the Red Sea and uh, in order to desalinize water and produce also hydropower. This is apparently not happening anymore for different reasons, but the current project is for Jordan to produce a, a Jordanian water carrier starting in uh, uh, Aqaba in the Red Sea and uh, uh, pumping, desalinizing water there and pumping water to Amman 
uh, <clears throat> so similarly to the uh, DC canal, but the difference is the, the source of water, which in this case would be the salinized water. Uh, the DC Canal project is operational since 2015, more or less, uh, groundwater being pumped from uh, the southern part of the country. And then treated wastewater, which is something um, that everyone is supporting. Um, and Jordan is doing quite well, about 14, 15% uh, today uh, of uh, water supply, it comes from treated wastewater. <clears throat> uh, water mismanagement. Uh, so water demand management uh, and water demand side solutions. Um, so while the previous ones uh, are all quite being implemented, uh, those are not really all implemented. And there are tariffs and subsidies removal. So increasing tariffs, especially for agriculture, uh, for water, uh, and reduce, reducing subsidies is something that the Minister of Water has suggested uh, so different times. However, the problem was that these solutions were always, and policies were always, uh, stopped <clears throat> or amended in the parliament. Uh, and this brings us to the political economy and the challenges of uh, water in Jordan, but we'll get there in a second. And then efficiency in agriculture, so regulations on crops, uh, tariffs again, which links to the previous one. Sorry. And then uh, non revenue water, so illegal wells closing the uh, stopping illegal connections challenging as well, even if uh, a campaign was launched in 2015 by the minister of that time. Um, but the challenge, as I was saying, is really uh, on the political economy. So who is influential and who is uh, strong enough and able to stop or not with certain policies? And as we, as we probably know, um, the Jordanian uh, parliament is uh, uh, quite representative of uh, uh, the rural communities of uh, the of the farmers and the four uh, and those have traditionally in Jordan represented an important and influential um, elite uh, in terms of uh, uh, political support for the country and that's why uh, it has always been quite challenging to try to pass uh, policies uh, reducing their benefits and rights on the, uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, we also need to remember, we, I mean, initially we mentioned agriculture 3%. I mean, it's not only 3%, it's not only the economic importance or aspect of agriculture, it's also the traditional, the cultural, but also the uh, rural development, the uh, role of agriculture and agricultural communities. And that's why it's important to maintain, especially in a country like Jordan, where most of the population is in the capital, uh, almost more than two thirds, almost uh, uh, four million, I, I suppose, uh, are in one city. So it's really important to maintain uh, also people living in uh, in the different uh, governorates uh, uh, across the country, and that's why it's always a bit of uh, of challenging to try to pass regulations uh, that undermine uh, the the role of agriculture in the country. Um, I would also just mention two more slides before closing. This one uh, is, so we spoke about supply and then demand side, but it's also important to reflect on the role of conservation. So increasing conservation. Uh, so uh, raising awareness and trying to shape the behavior of people. And that's something that has been supported by all, all actors or all stakeholders. And uh, so one way that I analyzed in one of my articles, which is here, is uh, uh, to look at the textbooks to try to understand how uh, education can also uh, uh, shape behavior of people and uh, of the youngest ones in the country. And then also uh, a project that was done was also to train a religious leader uh, to have them speaking about importance from a religious perspective to uh, save water uh, following, uh, yeah, uh, following the, 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 the examples uh, and uh, the lessons uh, uh, from uh, religious uh, uh, figures. And finally, also uh, another project that has been done recently uh, called the Water Journalism Academy to try to uh, target journalists uh, to uh, tell them and uh, involve them in seminars on the importance of water scarcity and water challenges to have them to write on these topics and raise awareness in newspapers. So 
the last uh, two slides on reflections, uh, it, it's very important to when, I mean, as a way to conduct research uh, uh, to un understand the political economy on environmental issues, uh, uh, to ask ourselves what is implemented and what is not, and why something is implemented and something is not. Um, the question is also on whether to increase the supply to meet the demand and maintain the status quo, or whether it would be better to challenge the, the status quo redistribution and sustainable water use. But then we need to also contextualize these water and environmental challenges uh, uh, and reflections within the political uh, economy, the political context, who, how uh, politically feasible would be, what would be the political uh, uh, implications of such decisions. So I think it's really about trying to contextualize issues and things. Finally, uh, what I learned from this project is that we really need to holistically try to understand the problem to be able to solve it. Because as you saw, if we look only at certain reasons, we would be more uh, likely to uh, adopt certain solutions. Uh, and uh, if you look at others, we would adopt other solutions. So it's really important to try to understand it fully before trying to discuss how to solve it. To do so, we need interdisciplinary research for complex problems. Uh, so, for instance, we all probably are familiar with the water and energy food nexus, but also looking at the rural development context, jobs, creation, migration, internal migration. Um, and this is something that the Aurora project and uh, I know that the University of Castle is really pushing forward to try to bring people together from different uh, disciplines and try to analyze and understand the problem from different uh, disciplines. Uh, we need to contextualize the water issue within the political economy, as we saw earlier. And uh, uh, finally, how should the Jordanian economy look like in the long term? So how do we want to arrive there? And is there a need for a new paradigm change? What are the conditions to facilitate such transition? So it's really about having a long term view. Uh, for instance, if we want to restructure agriculture, which kind of agriculture we want? What should the role of agriculture be in the country? And then how can we adapt everything else to make such decisions sustainable? Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to uh, a discussion and conversation with you. Um, yes, thank you very much for uh, the excellent uh, talk. Um, great. Um, we will now open the floor for questions. I'm certain that uh, there's quite a bit of um, uh, questions um, and um, yeah, uh, I'd like you to raise your hand. And uh, we have also already one uh, question by Benaza, please. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Soren. Thank you, Dr. Hossein, for this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, you have said that uh, Jordan is importing over ninety percent of its needs. Uh, and the counterpart, we know that not only Jordan, but also Morocco, Tunisia, and other North African and uh, Middle Eastern countries are allowing people to produce less efficient crops uh, for export. What the state is doing in regulating this issue? That's the first question. Second, does those people pay taxes to the country to compensate what they are using as water that is not renewable, especially uh, underground water? You know that in, uh, in um, Great Britain, the people are forced to um, give an idea on how, how much they earn from irrigating, from using underground water. They should declare their, 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 uh, what, 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 how much money they make from it. If they declare that they, it's negative, they don't earn money, they are not allowed to use underground water. This is not the case, unfortunately, in, in, in many region countries. The second question is um, uh, regarding the pollution. You didn't talk about pollution. I think I read many uh, reports about the, the, the issue of Israel polluting the, 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 the Jordan River. Is it, is it true or is it just uh, something that people are speculating on? Thank you. Uh, 
Um, thank you very much for your questions. Um, so concerning yeah, the, the, the questions on regulations and taxes, uh, as far as I, I'm aware, um, there's no regulations that I'm, that I'm aware about, um, regulations on uh, crops uh, and the less efficient type of, I mean, they were suggested in the past, but my understanding is that um, uh, they were suggested by some uh, donors agencies, but um, but the, and they were to some extent also supported by some ministries, but uh, they were not able to, uh, to put them in writing and uh, have them have them uh, passed uh, in the parliament. Um, and uh, concerning the taxes on water, I mean, I think that would be uh, very nice if uh, it was in place, no, to have taxes. Uh, depending on uh, how much water uh, they were exporting, uh, and uh, uh, also on uh, uh, to what the, to also to what kind of water was exported. No, I mean if it is treated wastewater, it would be different than exporting uh, uh, non-renewable groundwater resources. Uh, however, I'm not aware of taxes on on this. Um, I mean the taxes. I mean they would be. Uh, I mean, the users would have would would be paying the water tariffs. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the 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 current regulation. But they will not be. I mean, regardless of whether the uh, water is being used for uh, import for for national production or for export of agriculture. Um, finally, pollution. Uh, Pollution, good question. Uh, I mean, pollution in general is, I think, it's a uh, very, uh, really, very important issue. When it comes to water polluted that is uh, coming from um, the Jordan River and I mean, and seeing seeing uh, Israel as the polluter, I'm, yeah, more wavy about this. I mean, I'm not. I mean, we should probably ask uh, the Royal Scientific Society. I know that they are doing a lot of research on the quality of water uh, in the country. But from what I'm aware uh, or what I was told, uh, they only had um, uh, one major issue back in I think late '90s uh, when water that was uh, imported uh, from Israel resulted to be. Uh, Polluted, uh, which resulted also in uh, hospitalization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, I mean, yeah, that was one episode, and I'm not sure uh, where the issue was, like so, who, who polluted it and how and when. Uh, but that was mainly a one-off. Uh, the more than pollution, I think that the issue there is that the agreement clarified uh, how much water should uh, Israel give to uh, Jordan, but it did not clarify uh, the, the quality of that water. Uh, so, so yes, I, at some point in the past, uh, the issue was, was raised um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, while someone might expect uh, fresh water from the upper Jordan River, uh, obviously the quality of the water of the lower Jordan River is not good. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's there's several nuances, and that's usually, I mean, the challenge when, when uh, signing and negotiating agreements, uh, uh, you, it's always difficult to consider different uh, different aspects. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes, we have another question by Rayata. Please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Raya. I work in environmental policy and research in Jordan. Um, <clears throat> just to say first, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. I'm actually a big fan <laughs> of one of your papers about the shadow space. Actually, I think it's one of the most honest description of the current situation in Jordan. So. Um, maybe a question and a reflection. So disregarding pollution um, and related to something that I am focusing on in my work right now, which is waste management, um, not water. But I think there is an issue here or uh, maybe just a, an observation of, of basically the work that I've been doing in the last seven years for the waste sector. 
brings me to the conclusion that basically pollution from other sectors in Jordan to water resources such as groundwater is really overlooked um, by basically power decision makers in Jordan. I mean, when you talk about the waste sector alone, the way that the landfills and dump sites in Jordan are built and are maintained pose a really big and direct threat um, on water resources, especially groundwater resources. For example, the Azraq Basin, um, where on top of it lies the um, Azraq landfill, which is a, it's a basically an open dump site, no lining, no leachic lining, nothing. Um, so I think this is a, something that we, more should be done about this, um, about basically assessing pollution from other sectors and how it's affecting the water situation in Jordan. But my question, I'm going to go back to the subsidization of water. Um, I mean, I think, Hassam, you're Jordanian, so you know how little we pay for water. I mean, it's ridiculous when you think of the cost that people pay for water in Jordan. It really does not reflect. And I mean, I think this baffles me all the time about when we look at the news, when you look at articles about research and, and policy, and you keep seeing and reading about water scarcity in Jordan, and then when it comes to real life and you get your water bill every three months, and it's so insignificant, the value is so low. I think this is one of the major issues that should be addressed. And I know there's tension in Jordan about economic issues and, and high cost of living. So any tax that is even proposed to be increased could turn into a complete mess. Um, so I, I really think I think the government and I think decision makers are in a really really tight space on what to do. And I do agree with everything about the narratives on water insufficiency and water mismanagement. Um, I think it's a balance of all of these issues. Um, and I think I think just to say as a Jordanian, we have such a long way to go. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I just wanted to give these reflections and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Raya, for your very kind words and for uh, your comments. <clears throat> yeah, concerning uh, subsidies and uh, how much water uh, people are paying in the country, uh, it's obviously quite of a challenge, but uh, and also like speaking with different water professionals in Jordan, um, if we wanted to try to reduce the, 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 the water being used in agriculture, for instance, uh, they were saying that even increasing the water tariffs would not probably be that important because uh, uh, of the overall benefits that they, uh, I mean, change, I mean, to not change much uh, overall. Uh, and therefore, they would probably keep using the same amount of water. Um, which is challenging on the one hand. And then also like others who saying, well, maybe we should try to engage more with them and uh, increase the water efficiency. So like uh, uh, irrigations technology, but then obviously as we probably all know is that if, I mean, the, the temptation for them would be to use the same amount of water and simply expand the, 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 the land that so, uh, I mean to be good for their own business, uh, uh, but not but not for the groundwater resources being used. So it's always always tricky. And yeah, I mean I agree with you on on uh, pollution and um, uh, the issue of waste. Uh, um, concerning yeah, I mean treated wastewater, I think it's probably one quite way forward that is uh, and could be further supported uh, even if uh, uh, usually those that will receive uh, treated wastewater instead of fresh water i think of several farmers in the jordan valley were always complaining no, so no one obviously is going to be particularly happy of receiving it but um but yeah i mean there's different coping me mechanisms and uh, yeah we it's it's quite of a challenging uh, sector and uh, problem. Thank you. Um, Andreas, uh, you have a question, please. Yeah, thanks a lot, really, Hossam. Very um, thoughtful and informative and comprehensive talk on this issue. Um, <clears throat> I had a question. You, um, I mean, 
obviously, as you nicely said, and as we all know, Jordan is an extreme example of water scarcity. Um, nevertheless, it concerns certainly many countries around the world and very much around the Mediterranean. And um, you focus on kind of the instruments of legitimizing different approaches to water. Um, on the one hand, in the, in the um, I'm not too familiar with the case in the sense of I was surprised that as solutions emerging from these narratives all seems to focus on national solutions. Is that completely true? Is that the full story? I'm just out of interest. But then actually the more important question and it's more, it's also, it's not exactly one of research but it's one of what is the perspective of the stakeholders and what is realistic in all of these countries around the Mediterranean, um, then underneath the discourse is what you also brought up is the material basis in terms of what else to do with the rural areas and with the rural economies. So I'm wondering under this particular problem pressure of Jordan, how far have kind of visions, initiatives, um, how far has the discourse been brought and the more concrete ideas also for developing alternatives for rural areas that that decrease this kind of social construction of water scarcity. Thank you, Andreas. Um, so answering the first question on uh, the solutions, um, I would say that the main solutions uh, in the past decades supported by the Ministry of Water and Irrigation were mainly uh, actually on the regional dimension. Um, so there were mainly two. The first one was the DC uh, project, which is uh, a groundwater resource, no renewable groundwater resource shared with Saudi Arabia. And so there was this transboundary nature of the groundwater, uh, which made it uh, regional. And there was also the agreement between Saudi Arabia and Jordan in 2015 that uh, uh, clarified how this groundwater was uh, to be used by the two countries, which basically says uh, you, we can both use it for uh, domestic uh, and drinking purposes, so not for agriculture. Um, uh, and the other one was the Red Dead Canal, which uh, uh, currently is taking more of a national uh, dimension for Jordan, even if probably we, probably some of us have heard that a couple of months ago, uh, Israel and Jordan signed an agreement supported by UAE, uh, where uh, Jordan would, would, uh, would build a <coughs> renewable solar uh, energy, so would produce renewable uh, energy uh, via solar power uh, in Southern Jordan, financed by uh, UAE, and this energy would go to Israel in exchange for uh, desalinized water given to Jordan by Israel. Um, so that would be uh, a regional uh, project. However, like we need to wait because like this kind of regional projects, as, so, as we've seen for the Red Dead Canal have been uh, announced and uh, worked on for many decades, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we need to see how things evolve. Um, the other question on uh, rural, uh, I mean, currently, uh, currently, currently, it seems that uh, the the government and the political will for Jordan is to keep supporting the the, the uh, rightly so, I would say, the the, the rural communities uh, in their. Uh, environments and in the governor rates, uh, mainly in the direction of uh, the status quo and the for uh, agriculture and um, that kind of thing. So maintaining the status quo. However, uh, depending on who you speak with, uh, I mean, speaking with uh, former colleagues from AUB or also uh, other uh, colleagues uh, in Jordan, some of them would argue that maybe we should uh, rethink uh, this uh, investment on uh, jobs in agriculture for rural communities and try to develop uh, new types of uh, sectors uh, and jobs. More, I don't know, like uh, private sector development uh, on the one hand, but also ecotourism. Uh, so different kind of uh, uh, like more, 
small industries and more small uh, kind of uh, uh, manufacturing linked to traditions and uh, uh, but then like it also it's also a question of uh, how many jobs can we create in that kind of sector ecotourism i mean it's something that jordan has been already working on but uh, it, i mean we probably need more studies to identify which kind of uh, transition should we go towards um, and how can that transition be environmentally friendly um, but yeah that's probably a challenge for the next uh, decade but the direction of jordan so far it's more about trying to increase the supply to maintain the current uses uh, while obviously trying to tell farmers to reduce the over exploitation of groundwater resources which is it's easy to say, but difficult to, <laughs> to implement. Yeah. yeah Thanks, and sorry to not capture the regional dimension sufficiently okay. at first. We have, we have another two questions. Uh, I would like to take them together and then after that, uh, close uh, the, the list, so to say. Um, we start with Prasivi and then Alba Alma Vasre. Um, so the two questions, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I come from uh, Indonesia, Southeast Asia. So we have too much water. We have really high precipitation. It's really interesting to follow your presentation because this question of scarcity could be also put in the context of flooding in our context. My specific question is about urban agglomeration as a, perhaps a significant population of uh, Jordan live in Amman. And I wonder how much urban agglomeration is hold responsible for scarcity and maybe also to push into solution because I can imagine the density and the uh, urban uh, living takes different uh, style of uh, consumption. And then also maybe then uh, they also produce more uh, wastewater for the domestic use. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, Albara Alma Vasre. Uh, uh, hi, hello Sam, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, yeah, I want to talk about uh, those solutions uh, suggested by different uh, school of thoughts, uh, so to say, depending on their interpretation, what is the cause, the main cause of the scarcity. Uh, but, uh, we can also talk about numbers uh, because uh, uh, the deficiency now uh, uh, in Jordan is, uh, I think it's around 350 million cubic meter per year. Uh, and um, uh, there's uh, this, uh, and I think even with including uh, this uh, uh, big project that has been talking about for a long time about the Red Sea, uh, Dead Sea Canal, it's also, it doesn't uh, close the gap of deficiency. It rather, uh, uh, so to say, uh, try to maintain the minimum uh, uh, share uh, of water per capita, not to drop uh, even less. I think now it's uh, around uh, maybe 70 or 80 uh, 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 meter cube per year per capita. And uh, if nothing uh, is, done, like if this project is not done, it may drop to 50, maybe by 200, uh, 2050 or so. Uh, so um, if we uh, say that the government took all the measurements to reduce uh, uh, water loads or increase water tariffs or uh, improve the efficiency of agriculture, are there numbers that suggest that if those steps are taken, that it will really close the gap or is it just that we really have too many people and just very limited uh, water resources and the climate change is also not helping with that. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for these very interesting questions. Um, so concerning the first one, the urban population and life size, <clears throat> Um, very good point, because that's something that emerged during my uh, interviews and my uh, fieldwork in the country, especially uh, when I uh, 
when I went to the rural areas and for instance, to Wadi Ram and to the desert uh, of uh, Southern Jordan. And I spoke with, uh, with the local Bedouins there. And uh, it was very interesting because they were very much aware of the uh, water scarcity situation in the country. Um, however, when I was asking how it was impacting and affecting them, they kept telling me that they've always been uh, used to live in uh, water uh, scarce areas. I mean, they, they grew up and always lived in the desert. So, and they, so they had uh, a, a lifestyle that consumed very little water, firstly, and then uh, they also developed uh, coping mechanisms. So they knew how to, uh, to live with little water, they knew how to find and where to find the water. So it was also something that was uh, uh, yeah, taught by their parents, their grandparents. So it was, uh, it was normal for them. However, when speaking with uh, people living in urban areas, that's where the issue of water scarcity uh, emerged. Even if, I mean, also in the cities, I mean, they, uh, they certainly use much more water. However, uh, in Amman, they all quite are used to living in a water challenge situation. Therefore, they know when, I mean, water usually comes only once a week for a few hours, so they know which day it will come and they develop coping mechanisms also, also for, uh, for, for living with uh, uh, little water. And so they store it, they, uh, when, when is the water day, which is the day when water arrives, they would uh, uh, turn on the washing machines. And so it's like they, they have all a way of coping and living in, uh, in, in certain ways. Uh, and there's also some articles published on this topic, uh, which is uh, which is very interesting because it really shows uh, coping mechanisms in urban and rural areas uh, in water are scarce areas such as in Jordan. Concerning the other question, uh, interesting. Uh, um, I mean, it really depends. I mean, as you said, numbers. Uh, how can we interpret numbers and how, what do we make of numbers? Obviously numbers are important, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yes, I mean, if you, I mean, when I was speaking with the representatives of the water, of the Ministry of Water and Irrigation, they, they, they emphasize the urgency and the need for uh, the large projects that we mentioned earlier. Um, and emphasizing that also, oh, and also in the national water strategies, there's uh, many figures showing that even if we had these big projects, it still could not be enough um, to ensure water security in the country. Um, however, uh, I mean, it really depends because like those that would argue we, that we need to focus on water, better water management, would argue that if we manage to reduce uh, the non-revenue water, which is currently 40, 50%, and also uh, reduce the water used in agriculture, which is currently about 40%, then uh, we would not have water scarcity. We have, would have a water secure Jordan. But obviously, I mean, it's quite impossible to arrive to a zero water. I mean, I'm sure that even uh, Germany uh, or Indonesia have more than 10% uh, of non-revenue water. That's something natural. And also like non-revenue water means also that that water will go part of it to regenerate groundwater resources. So it's partly uh, back in the system. So, I mean, it really, it really depends on which numbers we use. I mean, we can use different numbers to, to argue different things. So, I mean, I'm sure that someone could argue that uh, if we reduced the uh, water leakages and the illegal water connections, then we would probably reduce 30% of uh, the water lost today of Jordan. And then uh, if we just decide to cut water for agriculture, uh, we would, but obviously, I mean, that's not obviously feasible. That's not realistic uh, from different perspectives. So, uh, but just one more comment uh, on the importance of water, um, not any water and on especially water leakages <clears throat> is something that it was mentioned to me several times uh, while I'm a man was that um, currently we are importing, we are, we are pumping, uh, uh, and obviously it's very energy consuming to pump water from uh, the southern part of the country, 300 kilometers north to Amman. So we are pumping uh, a large amount of water from the DC and in the future, probably also uh, decentralized water from Aqaba area to Amman. 
However, uh, about 30-40% of the water that is in the system is low revenue water, so we will lose it for uh, leakages and uh, physical losses. So their point was, why are we doing this? Probably we should firstly fix the leakages and uh, uh, the system of the pipes in Amman, and then we should pump this water from southern part of the country to the north, uh, which, I mean, sounds reasonable to me. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a quantitative, so like I don't, uh, I'm not an expert on numbers and, um, but uh, I'm sure that different solutions, I mean, I'm not suggesting that we should only go for demand side solutions or only for supply side solutions, we should, we should try to combine uh, a bit of both and, uh, and, uh, and arrive to a more sustainable use of water resources and fixing uh, the leakages is um, certainly something that I'm sure everyone would agree with. And that's something obviously that the government is already doing with the support of JICA in particular, with the Japanese uh, support. So something that, yeah, uh, we should try to keep working, uh, trying to uh, ensure that the water resources in the country will be enough for everyone uh, and uh, will be used uh, sustainably. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, there's a question. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, there are no more questions here. Um, thank you uh, again for the excellent talk and uh, for your replies to the lively questions. I think uh, we learned a lot um, about uh, Jordan water scarcity in Jordan. Um, so, um, if uh, uh, one or two of you should have uh, had uh, connection problems, uh, again, the talk has been recorded in this uh, on the YouTube channel from maybe a day after tomorrow. And uh, uh, we would like to announce another couple of uh, sessions uh, before closing. Uh, the first one will be on the um, second. Um, of uh, February, uh, also Wednesday at uh, 5 p.m. Um, it will be given by Buthaina Bridi, um, a, a scientist from Tunisia that uh, is um, a guest to our section here uh, in the University of Kassel-Witzenhausen and she will talk uh, about uh, organic agriculture and the challenges of organic agriculture and agroecology in Tunisia. Um, and um, then we will have uh, another session, uh, most likely on the 23rd of February at 5 p.m. Um, on um, the pesticide problem uh, in uh, modern agriculture and uh, what to do about it. Uh, and uh, it, uh, as a talk will be given by uh, the Dean of Faculty of Organic Agriculture in um, most likely uh, in Witzenhausen here in the University of Kassel, and we will have uh, uh, replies and discussions from the Aurora Consortiums uh, regarding this uh, kind of uh, social ecological problem. Um, yeah, uh, Andreas, do you have uh, your hand is still up? You, you don't have another question. Um, so with this uh, announcement, I would like to uh, thank you uh, everyone for attending and wish you uh, a great rest of the evening. Um, stay healthy and uh, as I said, um, um, please uh, um, enjoy the other talks also at the uh, YouTube channel. <laughs>